I'm Bill Dowling. I'm the uh, chair of the Department of Health Services and a professor in health services. And um, I'd like to tell you something about the uh, department and the MHA program and the MPH programs that uh, exist in the department and also uh, a relatively new PhD program in health services research, which we started up in uh, 2002. But let me go back and um, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. And um, perhaps the funniest thing about that is that neither one of my parents had anything to do with the government. They just happened to live there, which is quite unusual. My dad was a practicing physician, but uh, gradually got into academic medicine on the faculty at uh, George Washington University Med School. And when I was in high school, uh, we moved to the Chicago area, and he became the chair of the Department of Medicine at University of Illinois in Chicago. And the main reason I mention that is the um, uh, value that my father conveyed to my two brothers and myself was um, a great appreciation for academia, particularly higher education, for teaching and research, and particularly in the big public universities, which um, he felt strongly about, and I agree, represented uh, the top rung on the ladder of the promise we make as a nation of equal opportunity for everybody. And so both of my brothers, um, Neither one went into medicine, but both of them are in the academic sides of their uh, professions. In any event, I grew up more in the Midwest than um, the East Coast, and uh, my undergraduate degree is from Duke. I got interested in healthcare management because I was a management major at Duke, and I didn't want to go into medicine, but um, enjoyed hearing my father talk about the uh, medical side of uh, the field. and. So it seemed to me a very logical combination to um, pursue my MBA in healthcare management at the University of Chicago's um, School of Business. When I graduated uh, from there, I went to University of Maryland's hospital on the administrative staff for a few years, and then um, into the Medical Service Corps of the Navy for three years. Um, very fortunate to be able to do what I had been trained to do um, and meet my uh, military obligation at the same time. Coming out of the military, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and um, the director of the Master's in Health Administration program at University of Michigan, where I was interviewing for a job at the hospital, talked to me about um, coming on the faculty at University of Michigan uh, essentially to cover for a faculty member who was due to take a sabbatical the next year. And uh, although I had never thought of uh, the academic side of the field of healthcare management, um, he was persuasive and I agreed to do that for one year. Uh, this uh, faculty member didn't come back uh, the following year, so it turned into two years. And by the end of that period, I was um, hooked, I guess you could say, on academia dropped off of the faculty at Michigan and went back and uh, worked on my PhD at the University of Michigan, and uh, that is where my PhD is from. Uh, when I finished up that, I went back on the faculty of the Master's in Health Administration program. I was recruited to uh, University of Washington in 1974. I really was not uh, one of the founding fathers of the School of Public Health, but uh, shortly after the school was established in 1970, it was decided that um, it should uh, have a master's in health administration program in addition to the MPH and PhD programs that were uh, a part of its founding. Bob Day, who started out as chair of the Department of Health Services, uh, had been uh, uh, promoted to be dean of the school uh, a year or so earlier. And he, in turn, had promoted Bill Richardson, who he had brought to the Seattle to head the, um, or really to start up the Master's in Health Administration program. He had promoted uh, Bill to be chair of the Department of Health Services. So um, uh, Bob Day and Bill Richardson uh, recruited me to succeed um, Bill Richardson as director of the 
Health Administration program. Uh, it had just started up uh, when I arrived. The uh, first cohort of students graduated. I think there were three or four students in the first class. So um, I had a lot to do with uh, developing and growing what was a very small embryonic um, starting up uh, uh, MHA program at the time. I do want to relay uh, one important uh, a bit of history that really has defined the character of the MHA program. There was quite a debate going on in the field of healthcare management around 1970 uh, about whether uh, training for healthcare management should be uh, in schools of business administration. Remember, I had gotten an MBA with a major in healthcare management, or whether training for healthcare management would better be in schools of public health, where students would get an MPH but with uh, additional coursework in management. And that debate was um, raging in the field, I guess you could say. And some programs were in business schools, some programs were in schools of public health, some programs were in other schools. But as new programs were founded, like this one, they had to decide what was best. Um, Bill Richardson and Bob Day um, had a very clear idea that healthcare management was a multidisciplinary field, uh, drawing on both management science as well as public health science. And they took advantage of a mechanism that exists at the University of Washington to establish the MHA program as a group degree program, which really means it is academically housed in the graduate school. It's sponsored by the graduate school. Um, and the dean of the graduate school uh, appoints a multidisciplinary committee um, comprised of faculty from the relevant schools uh, to guide curriculum development and to assure to the quality of the program uh, from the perspective of the graduate school. So um, this group degree mechanism was taken uh, advantage of. The MHA program offers uh, its own degree, the MHA, rather than an MPH or an MBA. And there was a wonderful group of faculty from the business school, from the School of Public Affairs, from the medical school, from economics, from sociology, from urban planning, um, from the nursing school who were appointed by the um, dean of the graduate school to be essentially the supervising committee uh, for this group degree program. So to this day, the um, MHA program is administratively housed in the Department of Health Services in the School of Public Health, and we're delighted to have it. But from an academic perspective, it's a group degree program that uh, still is overseen by a committee of faculty appointed from various schools around the campus. Um, early on, because these schools uh, saw themselves as co-sponsors for this degree, uh, we were able to get MHA students in business school courses and public affairs courses and so forth because these schools felt that those students were, in a sense, as much theirs as students who were admitted uh, to their own degree programs. Um, my philosophy was, perhaps coming out of a business school um, health administration program, was that students needed strong management um, uh, skills. So the design of the program uh, for the first uh, uh, many years was one where our students essentially took the MBA core courses in the School of Business during their first year, and then the faculty taught courses that applied those disciplines. So they would take accounting in the business school, then we would teach a course on healthcare accounting. They would take economics in the business school, and we would teach health economics. They would take some basic management courses in the business school, and then we would teach courses that applied those management um, theories and skills and so forth to the unique aspects of healthcare management. And uh, that, for the first um, uh, 10 or 15 years of the life of the MHA program, uh, was the way the curriculum was structured. First year in the business school, mainly, and second year applied courses that we taught here in the 
uh, Department of Health Services. That um, receptiveness by the business school to our students um, was um, reinforced by uh, a couple of very practical uh, considerations. One, we had a grant from the Kellogg Foundation and then from HRSA for a number of years, as did many MHA programs, from the Kellogg uh, Foundation to start up the program and then from HRSA uh, each year uh, accredited MHA programs would get some uh, federal support um, because it was a shortage of uh, health care managers and this was uh, a federal program along with supporting other areas of uh, health uh, workforce training. To make a long story short, I paid the business school uh, part of um, what I got in my HRSA grant each year um, and that of course paved the way. But in addition, we had a philosophy that faculty that we recruited here with PhDs in various um, academic disciplines should have a joint appointment or an adjunct appointment in the school of their home discipline. So for example, the first faculty member that I recruited anew when I came here was uh, Cindy Watts, just completing her uh, doctorate in economics at Hopkins to teach our courses in health economics. And um, I asked the econ department and they were delighted uh, to give her a joint appointment in the economics department. So she taught some over there courses that were not necessarily about health economics, but that kept her up in her discipline, kept her um, uh, working closely with uh, economists and so forth. Um, others of my faculty had appointments in the business school or in public affairs and so forth, but more importantly actually taught courses in these other schools uh, that they wanted taught. Um, and so these were real joint appointments. And um, I always felt that that kept the faculty up to speed, if you will, in their basic discipline as well as um, their keeping up in healthcare management applications of their discipline. Uh, so the group degree uh, and the support we got from the various schools uh, was very important to the founding uh, of this uh, particular program. Uh, my recollection is that uh, when I was recruited in 1974, again, Bill Richardson was chair of the Department of Health Services, uh, Bob Day, then dean of the school, uh, the school and the departments were much smaller than they were today, uh, than they are today. Um, I think there were about four of us uh, who were the core faculty of the MHA program, which made up about half of the department. And then there were about four faculty who made up the core group of the um, what was then called community medicine uh, part of the Department of Health Services. Uh, Bill Richardson was chair. He shortly recruited Steve Shortell to uh, uh, essentially formally start up a research program in the Department of Health Services by starting up and getting federal funding for a health services research center. So Bill and Steve and one or two other faculty were sort of general Department of Health Services faculty. And then there were four or five of us who were associated with the MHA program and four or five of us who were associated with the um, community medicine program. Very small department. Another brief anecdote I'll um, mention was um, when I arrived in the summer of 1974, uh, the faculty of the department consisted of uh, Bill Richardson um, and uh, my succeeding him as director of the MHA program, a faculty member by the name of Art Legacy, a faculty member by the name of um, Tom Seifert, and a faculty member by the name of Al Blackman. Those were the core faculty for the MHA program. But about uh, three weeks before I arrived, and so when I arrived and reported for duty, I was told that Tom Seifert had left uh, to take a job at a Kaiser Hospital, I believe, in California. And Art Legacy had left uh, to take a job with um, uh, the Indian Health Service in Alaska. And so it was me and Al, and I can tell you we were feeling a little thin with regard to faculty at that time, and I wondered really what I had gotten myself into. 
uh, coming from the University of Michigan, which um, had quite a robust faculty. But um, there was a budget for the MHA program, and um, I immediately set out to recruit faculty. And as I indicated, uh, Cindy Watts joined us um, within a year uh, to replace Art Legacy in Health Economics. Uh, I had brought uh, Wanda Trevetti, who had received a PhD in operations research from the University of Michigan when I came from Michigan. Uh, I brought Wanden with me um, as uh, a research staffer on a research grant that I had at the time. And um, shortly thereafter, we converted him to a regular faculty member in the area of operations research. Um, I recruited uh, Steve Williams um, uh, about the time he finished up his doctorate at uh, Harvard in health services. So we began to rebuild um, the faculty of the MHA program, uh, which was growing um, partly on uh, new recruitments for mainly teaching programs, uh, but also from the beginning, of course, the department and the program uh, emphasized a research, and so part of our growth was funded by um, external grants and contracts of one sort or another. At the same time, the community medicine uh, program uh, was uh, growing. Uh, Malcolm Peterson and Betty Gilson and Dave Lawrence, who went on to head uh, uh, Kaiser many years later, represented sort of the core initial faculty there, and they were growing as well. Um, it was very important to me that uh, students uh, pursuing um, careers in health care management practice um, get some practice, I guess I would say, um, as a part of um, their educational experience. And so from the beginning, we required a, an administrative internship, that is a three to four month uh, experience, work experience, in a hospital or another healthcare organization um, during the summer between the first and second years. And then, of course, we wanted to help our graduates uh, get jobs in hospitals and other healthcare organizations in the Seattle area or elsewhere. And um, so one of my first orders of business was to uh, attempt to establish relationships with the leading um, healthcare executives in the Seattle area, all of whom, it turned out, had graduated from uh, other uh, health administration programs and it had and had uh, intense loyalties to Berkeley or to Minnesota or to um, uh, Johns Hopkins or to uh, whatever MHA programs they had come from. And so I had to try to break in and um, invite them to consider um, uh, their obligations to the University of Washington. And in some cases, uh, what we agreed on is that they would take an intern or a resident, as they were called at the time, from the University of Washington uh, MHA program every other year. Uh, the first um, CEO in the area that I struck that deal with was uh, Austin Ross, who was uh, the top administrator at uh, Virginia Mason, and that year, I believe, was the president of the Berkeley MHA program alumni association, so obviously had strong ties there. But he agreed that um, uh, it was uh, partly his duty to support the state universities uh, program. And so to this day, Virginia Mason tends to take um, uh, a University of Washington student uh, one year and a Berkeley student the next. And that kind of arrangement worked out very well. Some of the other CEOs who were very gracious in um, welcoming the MHA program to Seattle and supporting it in a variety of ways as guest speakers in our courses or taking our students for internships or taking our students for field experience projects and so forth. Roy Rambeck at the time was the executive director of uh, University of Washington Hospital um, and also one of the uh, top people in the American Hospital Association, and uh, he was very, very helpful. Uh, Truman Katz uh, was the administrator at Children's uh, Hospital at the time, and uh, very helpful. 
For the Providence system, there were a number of administrators, uh, Carl Munding in Everett and uh, Dave Bjornsson in Olympia uh, come to mind, as well as Peter Bigelow um, at Providence Medical Center in Seattle. Um, uh, Gail Warden, um, who later went on to the American Hospital Association and then to uh, Henry Ford Hospital, uh, was uh, CEO of Group Health uh, a few years after I arrived, and uh, also uh, many of our students did projects and internships and so forth uh, at Group Health. And finally, Bob Jutlin, uh, who uh, headed uh, Harborview, uh, was uh, a true gentleman and uh, welcomed this new uh, program to the area and was very supportive in taking our students and um, giving them field work experiences at his hospital and so forth. Uh, one of the most supportive people here was um, Leo Greenewald, who came not too long after I did to head the Washington State Hospital Association. And uh, Leo was very, very supportive of the program. And it was through the Washington State Hospital Association that we began to develop programs of continuing education for practitioners. And one of the first programs we developed was for uh, trustees, uh, that is, uh, board of trustees members uh, of the governing boards of healthcare organizations. And we worked very hard to put um, in place a rather sophisticated um, uh, program for trustees that we call Trustee Week, and it had a very unique uh, design. Uh, the first day and a half, Sunday afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, uh, was billed as um, a orientation program for new trustees. And then with a half a day overlap so that we could share some of our speakers, uh, the middle of the week was designed as a more in-depth, more intensive training program for more experienced trustees. And then the tail end of the week, uh, two days, was designed as a series of advanced uh, workshops for trustees who, for example, were chairing the finance committee or chairing the medical staff committee or chairing the planning committee. And so um, had been on the board uh, quite a while, had experience, uh, but um, needed more in-depth uh, training in the particular uh, area that they were leading in their institution. Um, the State Hospital Association in Washington um, uh, prevailed on the state hospital associations in Alaska and Oregon and Montana and so forth to co-sponsor this program. And for uh, four or five years, as I recall, this was, I truly believe, uh, the top uh, continuing education program for trustees in the country and um, achieved quite a bit of visibility for the program, but I'd like to think um, uh, took a, an important stride forward in uh, strengthening the governance of healthcare organizations in this area. But it was very important to connect with the field of practice, and um, another way we did that was, again, working through the Washington State Hospital Association, uh, developing a um, training program for managers uh, to keep the uh, skills of CEOs and um, other uh, executives from healthcare organizations uh, up to uh, snuff up to speed. And so we had wonderful collaborations with the um, practice community here in Washington, and I'd like to think um, made quite a contribution. Uh, in part, the territory that we had um, more or less to ourselves is quite vast because the closest health administration programs were at Berkeley uh, and at Colorado and at the University of Minnesota. So the entire Northwest quadrant, really, of the country um, tended to look to our program. I put on a lot of continuing education workshops in Montana and Idaho and Utah and Wyoming and so forth, all over the Pacific Northwest. And that was an important role that we enjoyed and we felt we made quite a contribution. With regard to research, as I indicated, um, Bill Richardson uh, recruited, about the same time he recruited me, recruited uh, Steve Shortell from University of Chicago to um, 
head up the Health Services Research Center in the Department of Health Services. And that started a very strong tradition of uh, research in the department um, that uh, characterizes, of course, the school and characterizes the um, entire University of Washington. And Steve Shortel uh, deserves uh, a lot of the credit for launching uh, what to this day is a very robust research program in the Department of Health Services. So his vision and bills about the importance of research um, uh, is a legacy we enjoy today. My own research, uh, shortly before uh, I was recruited away from Michigan, um, I had um, uh, obtained a grant from what was then the Research and Development uh, Office of the Social Security Administration, which ran the Medicare and Medicaid programs, uh, now CMS, but then SSA. And um, because there was quite a bit of discussion at that time about um, the shortcomings of cost reimbursement for hospitals. Uh, by and large, uh, hospitals were paid uh, their experienced costs. So whatever the hospital spent, in a sense, it got back uh, from the Medicaid programs and the Medicare programs, and the commercial insurance uh, companies tended to follow that lead. And um, it was felt that one of the reasons why costs were increasing so rapidly in the hospital sector was um, a result of cost reimbursement that does not have strong incentives to be efficient and uh, productive. So um, people were beginning to talk about um, uh, alternative methods of uh, paying hospitals under public and private programs. And um, the term prospective reimbursement was beginning to be talked about where uh, payment rates would be set in advance um, uh, on a per diem basis or a per discharge basis, and that's what the hospital would be paid, not its actual cost. So clearly there was an incentive there to keep your cost down below the fixed payment rate that you were going to receive. Um, and there was just beginning to be a little bit of talk about whether the federal government should shift to a prospective payment approach to paying hospitals. I noticed that there were uh, a handful of the larger Blue Cross plans in the country uh, that were experimenting with prospective payment. And one of the major experiments was by the uh, Blue Cross plan in uh, downstate New York that covered the New York City metropolitan area and actually much of the state of New York. And so I uh, wrote a grant uh, to get research funding uh, from Social Security Administration uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this first early experimental uh, prospective payment uh, system that Blue Cross of New York was using. And um, to my recollection, that uh, grant was funded um, about uh, a month or two before it turned out I was due to leave Michigan and go to the University of Washington. I was able to take that grant with me, and um, so I brought two or three research staffers who had uh, joined me at Michigan to carry out that research. And um, that was the uh, research that I brought to the department, and I would like to think that it was a major um, um, piece of research that led to um, what we know today as DRG reimbursement of hospitals. So um, uh, there was a change based on my studies and the studies of several others uh, that followed uh, that showed that this form of reimbursement was in fact effective in holding down hospital costs. Not as effective as we would like, but effective and certainly more so than cost reimbursement. So that uh, brought some research uh, with me into the uh, Department of Health Services and uh, brought uh, several strong researchers uh, who were willing to join me and come out here from Michigan. I can remember um, some periods when we were conducting interviews with um, uh, CEOs and others in New York 
and I was also uh, attempting to teach quite a bit. Recall we had a very small faculty at the time, and yet we would get uh, interviews lined up, and um, so the way I worked it was um, I would take the uh, red eye, that is a plane at midnight, on say Monday night, and that would get me into New York City at about 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Uh, Tuesday morning uh, in time to put in a full day of interviewing or meeting with people around the uh, prospective reimbursement study. I can remember to this day there was a 550 United nonstop uh, from JFK back to Seattle with the time changes would get back about 9.30 p.m. Seattle time. Uh, I would try to get a decent night's sleep. The next day I would teach, so the next day would be Wednesday, and then I would be on the red eye back to New York on Wednesday night. I would interview uh, people on Thursday, take the 5.50 nonstop back to Seattle, and so there was a period of several months there when I was teaching courses that met Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I was in New York um, working on my research Tuesday and Thursday. And I can tell you, I looked uh, like a dragged out dog uh, by the end of a couple of weeks of that. But we made it work, and uh, this coast-to-coast -coast research um, did in fact uh, take place, and I'd like to think that uh, the research team and uh, the research uh, made quite a contribution to what turned out to be a fundamental change in uh, hospital reimbursement. I'm not sure why, um, but the MHA program um, in its early years uh, began to gain uh, quite a considerable national reputation. Uh, Bill Richardson was very known nationally, uh, Steve Shortell certainly. We began to recruit uh, faculty like Cindy Watts and Steve Williams who uh, were well known outside of the University of Washington. And so we uh, enjoyed a very strong reputation uh, nationally as well as in Washington in the Pacific Northwest. And as a result, we uh, had many, many, many more applicants uh, each year than we could possibly admit. As a matter of fact, I recall one year uh, when we had uh, 250 applications for the 25 uh, places we had in the class, uh, and most years uh, about that. So we were in a position to be quite selective, quite choosy with regard to um, who we admitted. We wanted people who not only had very strong undergraduate uh, records, but who had substantial meaningful work experience prior to coming back to graduate school. And uh, I'm sure we missed uh, a lot of good people by not accepting people who had the former strong undergraduate records, but um, not much work experience. But nonetheless, we were able to uh, fill each class up with 25 people who had uh, very strong academic records as well as uh, significant work experience. Uh, we required uh, an interview um, of most uh, applications, uh, applicants, at least those from this area. And I remember one particular year, uh, I interviewed uh, three individuals. Um, I think they would be okay if I mentioned their names, Mike Rona, um, Cheryl Scott, and um, Margaret Stanley. All three of them uh, had some years of interesting, uh, good work experience under their belt, but frankly had not cut a particularly wide uh, bow wave with regard to their undergraduate academics. And so, um, presented uh, rather average um, undergraduate uh, GPAs and so forth. Um, but I liked the cut of the jib, I guess I would say, of all three of them, and uh, independently of each of the three of them. And so I said, if you will go to summer school and take, um, as I recall, accounting or statistics or economics, um, and get a B or better in each one of these courses, you can start into the MHA program in the fall. The three of them met in a 
a classroom on upper campus taking accounting or economics or statistics. They hadn't known each other uh, prior to that time. As they talked to each other, they put two and two together and learned that they were all there because Bill Dowling was requiring them to do that in order to be admitted to the program. And to this day, they are very, very close friends. Um, more importantly, however, um, as an example of uh, what graduates of the MHA programs have done, um, Cheryl went on to uh, quite an illustrious career, ending up as a CEO of Group Health. Uh, Mike Rona uh, started out at uh, Harborview, uh, but then went to Virginia Mason and became the president of Virginia Mason a number of years later. Uh, Margaret Stanley worked for Group Health for a while, um, then went with the um, what is now the Health Care Authority in charge of all health care purchasing for the state of Washington, then went to the uh, state of, or of California to head CalPERS, um, which purchases all health care for state employees in California, and then later came back um, here uh, to uh, work as a senior vice president for Regents, and more recently has become the executive director of the Healthcare Alliance, um, of the Puget Sound Health Alliance. So I guess I lucked out on those three decisions. Um, there are some people who say that you really can't discern very much from an interview, that we are kidding ourselves when we interview people, and uh, that may be right, but. Uh, that must have been a good day for me because um, uh, we certainly made the right decision by admitting the three of them. I had essentially started up the MHA program when I came out here from Michigan. Uh, Bill Richardson really deserves credit for that, as I mentioned. Uh, but when I arrived, the first class was graduating of three or four people. So in terms of uh, uh, a full student body and a full set of courses and recruiting new faculty and so forth. Um, I had quite a bit to do with uh, starting up and then uh, supporting the MHA program. Um, after about uh, seven years, I don't know whether it was the seven-year itch or a desire to get back into the field of practice and practice what I had been preaching in the classroom, I had an opportunity to go with the corporate office of the Providence Health System as a VP for planning and development there, working for uh, Donald Brennan, who was the president of the Providence Health System at the time. And I thought I would do that for a few years and then perhaps come back to academia, but uh, it turned out to be uh, just short of 15 years, and I enjoyed every minute of it, and I was enjoying it the day I received a call from Gil Oman who by then had succeeded Bob Day as dean of the school, uh, telling me that um, he wanted to talk to me about uh, the chairmanship of the Department of Health Services. Keep in mind that I hadn't had much to do with the community medicine side of the Department of Health Services when I was here before, but rather just the MHA program, so I didn't know too much about the department. I had continued to teach one course a year as a clinical uh, professor, but other than that, I hadn't had much contact with the department. Um, I was amazed when I came back that what had been a really small uh, group of faculty when I was here before had grown to about uh, 50. Um, and uh, this year, the uh, new grants and new contracts that came into the Department of Health Services uh, with just short of $20 million in new grants. Same last year, $20 million in new grants. The um, average steady state uh, externally funded uh, budget of the department, uh, mostly research, uh, but other important training grants as well, uh, runs around uh, 17 to 18 million a year. So the department had grown um, in terms of faculty from the handful of faculty that were here when I was first here uh, to about 50 and um, a huge research program and uh, the size of the student body had about quadrupled. So now 
in the MPH program, we have tracks in the social and behavioral sciences, maternal and child health, um, international health, um, and uh, in uh, health policy research. And we just started up a new track in health policy. In 2002, we started up a PhD program in health services. That was one of the uh, charges that Gil Oman gave me when he uh, offered me the chairmanship of the department. All of the other departments in the school had uh, PhD programs in addition to their master's programs, but the uh, Department of Health Services, because it had grown more slowly than the other departments initially, keep in mind that when the School of Public Health was founded, really carved out of the Department of Preventive Medicine in the medical school, uh, there were already biostatisticians, there were already epidemiologists, there were already people in the field of environmental health. So in a sense, those departments had a head start when they became the core departments of the School of Public Health. Health services um, was not represented in the faculty of the medical school, and so uh, health services really started up from scratch. And so although we uh, grew and became a very strong department in the school, our history is somewhat more recent in terms of size and in terms of research prowess and so forth. So um, at about the time the Department of Health Services was ready in terms of having a critical mass of very strong faculty, a uh, solid research uh, portfolio, uh, the university never seemed to have enough money uh, to put state dollars into supporting the establishment of a PhD program in the Department of Health Services. And it was sort of a, we knew we should have a PhD program, we're doing a lot of research that would support a strong PhD program. Actually, our colleagues around the country were surprised when we would say we don't have a PhD in health services uh, because they knew about the research going on in the department and our reputation. So one of my charges was to um, uh, get a PhD program started and uh, first under Doug Conrad's leadership and then Diane Martin's leadership. She had been on sabbatical the first year we started working on this. Uh, we put together a proposal to the university, um, put together a budget for the university, and uh, the PhD in health services was approved and um, funded, not as adequately as we would hope, but nonetheless uh, funded uh, sufficiently for us to start up the program. That's been a huge success. Uh, this year we have 70 applications for the seven spots um, that we admit to each year in the PhD program and um, our graduates uh, have gone on to do um, important work in health services research in university settings in the private sector and so forth uh, under Diane Martin's leadership. So that was one of the charges that um, I was given by Gil Oman uh, when I came. One of Bob Day's beliefs when he was uh, dean of the school that uh, Gil Oman agreed with and continued this tradition, as has Pat Wall, was uh, to have very strong departments, um, presumably strong department chairs, strong department faculties, but to look to the departments um, to run academic programs and to run research programs and in short, not to undertake a lot of programmatic initiatives out of the dean's office. For example, uh, many schools of public health run all of their continuing education programs, which are really multi-departmental programs, since all the departments in the School of Public Health support them, to run them out of the dean's office rather than in one or another of the departments. Likewise, um, many schools of public health will have a outreach uh, program of some sort to provide continuing education and technical assistance to public health practitioners uh, that will be run out of the uh, dean's office uh, as an independent uh, freestanding program uh, supported by all the departments but not the property, if you will, of any one department. 
Um, but Bob Day and uh, Gil uh, and then Pat felt very strongly, first of all, uh, that they didn't want to create a lot of additional departments because that uh, carries with it some administrative overhead and also begins to sort of defuse things uh, quite a bit. And second, they didn't want to um, run programs out of the dean's office. They wanted everything to be located in, supported by, sponsored by one or another department. Well, um, not to criticize my uh, colleagues, but biostatistics and epidemiology and to some extent uh, environmental health uh, are much purer to their disciplines than health services as a field. Another way to say it is health services is pretty messy, pretty heterogeneous all over the lot in terms of the disciplinary backgrounds of um, the faculty in health services, the kinds of activities they're interested in, the kinds of research they do, uh, the kinds of courses they teach. Um, quite messy, frankly, but fun, messy kind of department. So over the years, as um, new initiatives would come along, for example, when the field of public health discovered the social and behavioral sciences and the contributions that health behavior uh, and lifestyle and broader social determinants, uh, the contribution that they make to the health status of populations, for example. Um, so the behavioral sciences came along later than the epidemiology and the clinical science uh, uh, approaches to uh, public health, like infectious diseases and so forth. Um, so we needed to, uh, in the school, um, have a core faculty and a core set of courses in the applications of the social and behavioral sciences to um, public health and to health services. Where to put it? Well, doesn't fit very well in biostat, doesn't fit very well in environmental health, doesn't fit very well in um, epidemiology, so let's stick it in the Department of Health Services. So the Department of Health Services becomes the um, administrative home for really the social and behavioral sciences uh, faculty and courses and so forth uh, available to the entire school but housed in the Department of Health Services. Likewise, when uh, some embryonic at the time interest began to develop in international health, well, where are we going to put it? Doesn't fit in biostat very well, doesn't fit in epi very well, doesn't fit in environmental health very well, let's put it in health services. So health services acquires or starts up really uh, a track within its MPH uh, program uh, in international health. Likewise, when the school uh, took on uh, training in maternal and child health, where to put that? Well, let's put it in health services. That particular program actually is co-sponsored by EPI as well as health services, but is administratively housed in health services. International health was also co-sponsored, but administratively housed in health services. So. Um, Health services became messier and messier, if you will, uh, over time. Uh, it grew, brought faculty in with, uh, and students in with a variety of interests, um, and one of them was uh, international health. Each one of these tracks, because of limited state funding, uh, was actually quite small. Uh, we admitted uh, maybe a dozen students to international health each year, a dozen students to maternal and child health each year, a um, dozen students to each one of our several tracks each year. Um, and it was uh, a challenge to uh, find the funding to uh, keep these areas of specialization um, working, but we managed to piece it together. Of course, much more recently uh, with the uh, Gates grant to uh, endowment to found the Department of Global Health. Um, that area is uh, much strengthened in teaching and research, and so the international health faculty and the small international health program, which had been in health services for many years, uh, has moved over to um, global health, 
under the leadership of Steve Gloyd, who had been the director of the um, International Health Track in Health Services. And uh, I'm sure they're much better resourced and much able to grow and to touch um, uh, all throughout the university, uh, as well as all throughout the world, um, than they were when they were sort of buried down in the Department of Health Services. But um, we enjoyed um, the international health faculty and program, and of course wish uh, King Holmes and Steve Gloyd and the new department well as they carry that program the next step. Another program that uh, found its way to be home-based in health services was uh, started up actually when Bob Day was dean, and that was uh, what we call the EDP program, the Extended Degree MPH program for working public health practitioners who can't uh, take off two years and come back to school uh, on a full-time basis. Uh, that was a very small program in the first number of years. Uh, I remember financially very bumpy whether the school could uh, find a way to keep that going because it had to be self-sustaining on tuition uh, revenue. Uh, but um, that program, too, was uh, put into the Department of Health Services to administer on behalf of the school. I don't want to suggest that the courses in Biostat and Epi and Environmental Health, as well as Health Services, aren't supported by those departments. They are. But the Department of Health Services has been the home for the school's uh, EDP program for many, many years. That is a real success story. Um, I have been in rural Alaska and bumped into um, public health uh, workers uh, who received their MPH from the University of Washington. That program over the years has graduated close to 500 uh, people. And because the closest uh, schools of public health are Berkeley and Minnesota, once again, we have a rather huge territory that looks mainly to the University of Washington and mainly where our graduates go. And so if you're just about anywhere in Wyoming or Idaho or Washington or Oregon or Alaska or Montana, you will bump into uh, people who are graduates of the EDP MPH program at the University of Washington. A real success story and a real contribution that this school has made not just to the state of Washington, but to the entire uh, Pacific Northwest. Likewise, another program that is a school program that is the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. This is the school's major outreach uh, program to reach uh, public health practitioners in state and local health departments and community organizations uh, that work in the field of public health again, throughout the Pacific Northwest. So the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice um, uh, puts on continuing education programs, uh, provides technical assistance, uh, provides training of a whole variety of sorts, um, and the Department of Health Services is the administrative home for that uh, program and has been for a number of years. Uh, that program was uh, quite inadequately funded uh, up until the bioterrorism threat came along, and all of a sudden uh, CDC and HRSA and many other uh, government uh, uh, agencies were willing to fund uh, programs that could keep uh, practitioners, could get practitioners uh, up to speed with regard to bioterrorism uh, and um, uh, those kinds of threats. And so we have enjoyed, frankly, uh, much better support in the last uh, four or five years. And under the leadership of Jack Thompson and uh, Mark Oberly, the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice has uh, grown and is uh, serving the Pacific Northwest um, even more substantially than it was able to do before.